for being here, Commissioner. It has been a great uh, privilege to be able to work with you today and, uh, of course, during the past months, especially uh, as a Greek governor, I have to say that with your help, we managed to tackle these emergencies that uh, we had to face during the summer with the wildfires in Greece. And uh, we are very thankful for that. And the fact that you visited Greece in person to see the disasters and uh, hold several meetings, one of which was with the Greek, uh, Greek governors uh, uh, in our association. And I thank you very much because through your work, we have seen how important the European Union's coordination is for natural disasters. So before starting this session today, International Day for Disaster Reduction, let us commemorate the victims of several natural disasters that uh, many European regions had to tackle last summer. Let's see the video. Dear Commissioner, dear Special Representative, ladies and gentlemen, today's debate is held on the International Day of Disaster Risk Reduction. Let me start by sharing my deepest sympathy with every local leader, every community, and every person who has been affected by natural disaster all across Europe. I would now like to hold a one-minute silence in remembrance of everyone in Europe and across the world who have lost their homes, loved ones, and livelihoods, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Today's debate, Commissioner, comes after a period where many of uh, our regions, cities, villages all across Europe were severely hit by floods and fires. From the fires in Limassol in Cyprus, in the Attica region and the Evia Island in Greece, in Provence in France and Sicily and Campania in Italy, to the floods in the German-speaking community of Wallonia in Belgium, and Rhineland, Palatinate, and North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. In my home country, Greece, 11 EU member states came to our side during the summer fires, which burned more than one million acres in two weeks only. More than 1,000 houses and many businesses burned down or were severely damaged. 
Commissioner Lenarchitz, uh, at my invitation, you met with the governors of the Greek regions and our Prime Minister, and I would like to thank you again for your response and your support. It is during times of crisis that we see European solidarity. It is not only during times of crisis, but during the aftermath that we need to help our regions, cities, and villages. To think over 20 years, natural disasters were connected with 77 billion euros of economic loss, only in Europe. With climate change, natural disasters are becoming even more severe and more regular. So we need, we need to restore now our natural environment and to build more resilient communities. And the time is now. We have no time to lose. Dear Commissioner, dear Special Representative, let me suggest that the European Commission, UNDRR, and our committee launch a task force to review locally and regionally resilience, to identify needs, and to assess the coordination between the different levels of government. We could establish a regional resilience platform to support local and regional authorities to strengthen the resilience, informing them of the support that is available at any time and share best practices so that together we are better prepared and more resilient for the future. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Tsitsikostas. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for the invitation to discuss natural disasters and also to mark together the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, which is today. I'm also pleased to be joined by uh, Mrs. Uh, Mami Mizutori, Special Representative of the UN Secretary General that I understand will speak uh, <clears throat> after me. The European Union has always enjoyed a stro strong partnership with the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. And this alliance is more important now than ever before in view of our changing world. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the authority on the science of climate change, has recently published its latest report. The report leaves no doubt. Climate change is human-made, and every additional degree of warming will result in more complex disaster risks. Here in Europe, we are already witnessing the fallout from these developments. Over the course of the summer, as you said it already, President, our regions experienced more intense natural disasters than ever before. We all recall the tragic floods that ravaged villages and towns in Belgium and Germany, and the forest fires that ripped throughout many countries in southern Europe, as well as tornadoes in Central Europe. The EU has responded quickly to these disasters. Following requests for assistance, the EU civil protection mechanism was immediately activated and assistance was rapidly offered to requesting member states. Through our Emergency Response Coordination Center, we supported and facilitated the deployment of more than 1,300 first responders from 14 countries across Europe to help the countries that were affected by the emergencies. We also helped to mobilize multiple airplanes, helicopters, and boats to assist with local response efforts. I wish to thank our member states for their offers of support. These are tangible examples of EU solidarity. But the trend is clear for all to see. Climate change is changing our lives profoundly. Our regions, our towns, our settlements face a new reality, more intense natural disasters, new and more complex disaster risks. This means 
that we need to reinforce our efforts across the whole disaster management cycle, from prevention to preparedness and from response to recovery. To do this, we must work with all of our member states to identify the right lessons and learn from this summer's disasters. Certain points are already evident. Our civil protection system needs to be strengthened across all of its dimensions. Already this year, the EU civil protection mechanism has received nearly 100 requests from states looking for assistance and support. With each passing year, the number of activation is steadily on the rise. All of this places additional pressure on our civil protection resources. To reduce the burden, we must step up our prevention efforts for all types of human-induced and natural disasters, including geological threats like volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. We also need to strengthen climate mitigation. This is how we can achieve societal resilience. As part of the European Green Deal, the EU has set an ambitious target of zero net emissions by 2050. By reducing emissions and minimizing the rise in global temperatures, we can reduce the likelihood of more climate-related disasters. These goals are ambitious, but ambitious, ambitions are necessary. Of course, none of these changes can happen without you, our regional and local representatives. Local communities are the first to be hit when a natural disaster strikes. Regional authorities play a crucial role in the immediate aftermath of emergencies but also in raising disaster risk awareness and ensuring prevention, preparedness, and protection. It is therefore important that you have a prominent role in the shaping of disaster risk management strategies. As part of the EU civil protection mechanism, we will establish a dedicated knowledge network, an open, commonly owned, shared space for all experts to exchange and share their views. The European Union will actively involve local and regional actors through this framework. At the same time, we count on insights of regions to help inform our member states' disaster risk assessments and disaster risk management plans. Such assessments will contribute and help us in this path of development of EU-wide disaster resilience goals and scenario plans over the coming months and years. Your cooperation will be key as we seek to reduce natural disaster risks. We will count on your support to help build local resilience at the community level. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank you for supporting our work in this area to date. The Committee of the Regions is an important ally and a strong friend, and it proved that with its very positive support, a positive assessment of our revision of the Union Civil Protection Mechanism. Therefore, I look forward to our continued good cooperation, and I'm uh, looking forward to listening to your experiences and your insights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, I would like to welcome at this point Mami Mizutori, the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Head of UNDRR. Uh, Ms. Mizutori, you have the floor. Thank you very much, dear President Tsikostas. Dear Commissioner Renacic, ladies and gentlemen, members of the European Committee of the Regions, thank you for welcoming me here today. I am honoured to address the 146th plenary of the European Committee of the Regions alongside Commissioner Lenacic on this important topic. And I am hearing the sense of urgency in the voice of the President and the Commissioner. Because, yes, over the past few months, Europe has seen dramatic events, flooding and wildfires causing great trauma 
as seen with the forest fires in Greece and the Mediterranean basin, floods affecting Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France, the volcanic eruption affecting the Canary Islands. This demonstrates the complex risk landscape across the European region and the importance of solidarity and cooperation. The compound effects of these events, many related to climate emergency with the COVID-19 pandemic, this demonstrates the need for greater investment in disaster risk reduction and a multi-hazard approach to disaster risk management. May I join the President and the Commissioner in offering my deepest sympathies, thoughts to the people and communities and governments affected and UNDRR is here committed to support efforts towards the reduction of disaster risk. As we come out of the pandemic crisis, we must build back better, build resilience, and not create new risks. COVID-19 has demonstrated the need for a whole-of-government approach, both vertical and horizontal, that leverages the capacities of all relevant line ministries along with national, regional, and local government bodies responsible for disaster risk, all playing a crucial role. Furthermore, the last 18 months has reinforced the importance of international cooperation for disaster preparedness and prevention. In this increasingly interconnected world, in this multi-hazard era, international cooperation is vital for having good global risk governance. On today, the day of the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, we stand still and take stock of how international cooperation is at the heart of European efforts to build resilience across the continent and beyond. The collaboration of UNDRR and the European Committee of the Regions, and of course with the European Commission, to work further on urban resilience through a joint plan of action and collaboration in the Making Cities Resilient 2030 is a strong political recognition of our reality. And I would like to here commend the strong leadership of Commissioner Lenacic and the European Commission, not only this summer, but throughout in driving the European engagement on the implementation of the Sendai framework while responding to the many crises in the continent. To achieve a transformative approach to disaster risk reduction, it is necessary to work together, especially considering that cities and regions are always at the forefront when a disaster strikes, and you are the source of initiatives and innovations to build resilience of your citizens and systems. The Making Cities Resilient 2030 initiative will support cities to put in place local disaster risk reduction strategies and assist in the strategy's implementation. This is a cross-stakeholder initiative for improving local and regional resilience through advocacy, sharing knowledge and experiences, establishing city-to-city -city learning networks, injecting technical expertise, connecting multiple layers of government and building partnerships. I encourage all cities and regions prepared here today to join MCR 2030, and I have heard the urgent call from the president to create a task force amongst ourselves, which I welcome very much. Enhancing resilience across the region will also be key to the European Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction, which will convene 55 member states and stakeholders from the European region to assess progress on implementing national and local disaster risk reduction strategies, which are the foundation of good risk governance for prevention and response to disasters. Taking place right after COP26, from 24 to 26 November, hosted by Portugal, the forum will serve as a platform to reflect on the lessons learned from the pandemic and the increasing impact of global warming and extreme weather. And local governments are a very important stakeholder in this platform. In fact, today marks the day, marks the launch of UNDRR's Prevention Saves Lives campaign in Europe, 
in the build-up to the forum. Investing in prevention builds resilience and saves lives. It should never be seen as a cost. This is the gist of the campaign, and we can only take it forward together with you who are always at the front line of disasters. So I look forward to working together in advocating for a strengthened engagement of local and regional actors at the EU level and beyond through our joint action plan and to welcoming you all at the European Forum. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, let's start now with our debate with our members and I would, I would like to give the floor now to Alberto Sirio from the EPP, please. Grazie Presidente, grazie Signor Commissario e Signora Rappresentante Speciale Mizzutori. Eh, sono il Presidente della Regione Piemonte, una regione che eh, in Italia, al pari degli amici della Sicilia e di altre aree del nostro Paese, è stata duramente colpita, come lei ha ricordato Presidente, dalle eh, recenti situazioni che hanno caratterizzato soprattutto gli incendi boschivi durante l'estate. Ma parliamo non solo di incendi, parliamo di alluvioni, parliamo di un territorio molto fragile sotto il profilo idrogeologico. Ed è naturale che sono i livelli regionali e locali che si occupano poi della gestione del rischio di queste catastrofe, così come della prevenzione dei rischi e delle operazioni di risposta ai disastri naturali. Le regioni d'Italia, la mia regione anche dopo l'alluvione del 1994, ha attivato un sistema di protezione civile molto forte, una propria organizzazione attiva nel quadro delle strategie e dei piani d'azione nazionali. È chiaro però che le capacità organizzative e operative delle singole regioni sono eh, diverse tra di loro, sono diverse addirittura all'interno degli stessi Stati membri e sono diversi tra Stato membro e Stato membro della nostra Europa e di conseguenza l'azione complementare dell'Unione Europea dovrebbe essere sempre di più quella di sviluppare un approccio che sia sì differenziato ma coordinato in base alle diverse esigenze che ci sono a livello regionale. Esattamente un anno fa veniva approvato da quest'Aula il parere di cui io ero rapporteur, relatore, sul rafforzamento del meccanismo unionale di protezione civile e sono lieto di constatare che la dotazione finanziaria per il periodo 2021 e 2028 aumenterà di oltre un triplo, a testimonianza di come ci sia un'attenzione concreta forte sugli investimenti da realizzare. Il rafforzamento di questo strumento è eh, ancora però una tantum perché di fronte ai cambiamenti climatici e alla crescente frequenza dei rischi naturali dobbiamo espandere e rafforzare continuamente sia la prevenzione dei disastri sia la nostra capacità di risposta collettiva. Per questo è indispensabile anche una maggior flessibilità e soprattutto mi permetta signor Commissario noi abbiamo e registriamo un problema perché la maggior parte dei disastri naturali non conosce i confini. Di conseguenza la cooperazione trasfrontaliera diventa essenziale per prevenirli e rispondere efficacemente quando si verificano. E in tal senso è fortemente auspicabile una revisione del regolamento sull'utilizzo del Fondo di Solidarietà dell'Unione Europea. Perché i cambiamenti climatici hanno fatto sì che oggi gli episodi di avversità naturali molto spesso non sono estesi geograficamente ma sono molto intensi laddove si verificano per cui rischiano di colpire in modo assoluto aree piccole, aree ristrette, che poi nella conta complessiva dei numeri che il Fondo di Solidarietà Europeo vuole per la sua attivazione non sono mai sufficienti a far sì che gli aiuti possano arrivare. Per questo, e concludo, è auspicabile che così come il clima cambia, così come le avversità atmosferiche e naturali cambiano, anche i regolamenti di utilizzo dei fondi si adeguino a queste nuove esigenze che l'assetto climatico ci impone. Grazie. Thank you very much. Mr. Giorgos Patulis from the EPP, please. Kyrie Proedre, Kyrie Pitrope, Kyrie Skitiri Sinadelfi, the adapocracy se catastasis ectactis anagis, the economisi anthecticotitas se polis ke periferias, Γίνεται όλο και περισσότερο το μέτρο της προσαρμογής στα δεδομένα της κλιματικής κρίσης. Οι εμπειρίες μας από το φετινό καλοκαίρι στην Αττική, στην Ελλάδα, 
και ήταν πρωτοφανείς, αλλά και όχι μη προβλέψιμες πυρκαγιές, πρέπει να ληφθούν λοιπόν υπόψη για να διαμορφωθεί το πλαίσιο εντό του οποίου πρέπει να διαμορφωθεί μια σύγχρονη, ολοκληρωμένη πολιτική προστασίας και δασοπροστασίας. Κυρίε και κύριοι, η περιφερειακή διαχείριση είναι το κλειδί για τη βελτίωση του συστήματος της πολιτικής προστασίας. Διότι η πολιτική προστασία πρέπει να σχεδιάζεται, να εξοπλίζεται, να υλοποιείται και να παρεμβαίνει προληπτικά και καταστατικά με βάση τις τοπικές και περιφερειακές ιδιομορφίες και όχι με βάση προσεγγίσεις εκ των άλλων. Επιβάλλεται μια άμεση αναδιάρθρωση της πολιτικής προστασίας. Και αυτό είναι κάτι προς το οποίο κινούνται πολλές κυβερνήσεις εντός και εκτός Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης. Θεωρόμαστε ένα νέο μοντέλο, χρειαζόμαστε ένα νέο μοντέλο πολιτικής προστασίας βασισμένο στην περιφερειακή διαχείριση με έμφαση στην πρόληψη και στην αποκέντρωση αρμοδιοτήτων με στόχο τη διασφάλιση της έγκαιρης και άμεση αντιμετώπιση της διαχείρισης των κρίσεων. Με τα λόγια αυτά, θέλω να ολοκληρώσω και να εκφράσω την υποστήριξή μου στο ψήφισμα σχετικά με την επικείμενη διάσκεψη των μερών της Σύμβασης Πλαισίου του ΙΕ για την κλιματική αλλαγή. Και βέβαια να ευχαριστήσω κύριε Πρόεδρε και σας και το Συμβούλιο για τη δυνατότητα σήμερα να μιλήσουμε επαφορμή των προσπαθειών της Ευρώπης για τα ζητήματα που άπτονται του ενδιαφέροντος και αφορούν τη ζωή και την κλιματική αλλαγή τελικά. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ Περιφερειάρχη, κύριε Πατούλη. The floor now to Mr. D. Rupo from the PES Group. Euh, Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Commissaire, Madame la Représentante spéciale, dans ma région, en Wallonie, dont je suis le ministre président et le vice-président va s'exprimer dans un instant, nous venons de vivre des inondations jamais connues depuis 200 ans. 209 communes sur 262 communes que compte la Wallonie ont été sinistrées. 40 morts, 100 000 personnes sinistrées, 45 000 bâtiments partiellement ou totalement détruits. Et dans certaines communes, plus de 50 de leurs bâtiments ont été sinistrés. Et cette catastrophe, comme vous venez de l'indiquer tous, s'inscrit parmi les 7 500 catastrophes naturelles majeures connues dans le monde ces 20 dernières années. Le réchauffement climatique de notre planète contribue indiscutablement à ces dérégulations catastrophiques. Outre l'impact matériel, l'impact social est effrayant. Ce sont les personnes les plus faibles et de plus faibles conditions de vie qui sont les plus touchées. Monsieur le Commissaire, outre la nécessité de lutter efficacement et d'une manière préventive contre le réchauffement climatique, en Wallonie, l'heure est maintenant à la reconstruction et au soutien financier et psychologique des personnes gravement éprouvées. Mais les recettes du budget de ma région est de 15 milliards d'euros. Et mon gouvernement va devoir dépenser au moins 3 milliards d'euros pour venir en aide aux sinistrés des inondations. Et ces 3 milliards d'euros s'ajoutent à 3 milliards déjà dépensés pour éviter le collapse systémique de notre économie et de notre protection sociale suite à la pandémie de la Covid. Il faudra donc beaucoup d'argent, beaucoup d'argent pour réduire les conséquences des inondations catastrophiques. À notre demande, la Belgique, en tant qu'État membre, pour la première fois, a introduit une demande d'aide au Fonds de solidarité de l'Union européenne. Et le budget de ce fonds de solidarité, vous le savez mieux quiconque, est une enveloppe actuellement fermée. La Belgique n'est cependant pas le seul État membre touché par les catastrophes naturelles de cet été. Plusieurs États membres introduisent tout naturellement des demandes pour avoir accès au fonds européen. Mon sentiment est que sans accroissement du budget global du fonds de solidarité, Chaque État membre solliciteur risque de ne recevoir qu'une aide négligeable. Aussi, à l'instar de ce qui a été fait pour la Covid, et je pense 
que ça a été bien fait. Il me semble que maintenant, le budget consacré pour le Fonds de solidarité en 2022, fin 2021-2022, devra être suffisamment important pour couvrir les, les demandes des États membres euh, touchés par des catastrophes naturelles. Le regard, et on l'a dit tout à l'heure, et donc l'appréciation des citoyens à l'égard des institutions européennes se forge notamment et peut-être surtout dans les crises qui les touchent directement. Et nos institutions européennes ont besoin d'un large soutien des citoyens à un moment où notre démocratie européenne est malmenée. Alors en conclusion, Monsieur le Commissaire, les citoyens sinistrés, je vous pose la question, peuvent-ils compter sur votre détermination pour tenter d'obtenir un budget plus important pour le Fonds de solidarité de l'Union européenne Peuvent-ils espérer un soutien plus significatif de la Commission Pour notre part, soyez assurés que nous soutenons votre action et nous vous remercions. Merci beaucoup. Uh, the floor now to Mr. Borsus from Renew Europe Group, please. Voilà, merci, Monsieur le Président. Dans la foulée de l'intervention des lieux d'Iroupo, je voudrais, euh, Monsieur le Commissaire européen, Madame la représentante spéciale, bien chers collègues, tout d'abord, euh, avec vous, m'associer à, à l'hommage que vous avez rendu à l'attention des victimes de tous les proches, de toutes celles et ceux qui ont été frappés par euh, les événements de ces derniers mois et singulièrement de l'été dernier. En ce qui nous concerne, Elio Di Rupo vient de rappeler euh, en Wallonie le nombre de victimes et le nombre de personnes touchées par les inondations. Signalons encore que l'estimation totale des dégâts euh, en Belgique dépasse aujourd'hui les 4,8 milliards d'euros de dégâts. Dans ce contexte, je voudrais exprimer des remerciements des remerciements suite à la solidarité que nous avons euh, pu observer, dont nous avons bénéficié venant euh, d'autres États membres, venant des régions voisines, euh, venant des citoyens, venant bien sûr du niveau européen. Cette euh, solidarité a été euh, extrêmement présente et je veux vraiment le souligner. Dans la foulée de ce qui vient d'être mentionné, bien sûr ce débat renvoie au débat que nous venons de tenir concernant l'urgence de prendre des mesures, de prendre des dispositions de lutte contre le réchauffement, le dérèglement climatique et les phénomènes naturels excessifs dont nous venons de parler, qu'ils s'appellent « Green Deal »,« Fit to 55 » ou d'autres engagements encore. Par ailleurs, je pense que l'investissement européen doit aussi permettre de soutenir les efforts de prévention, les efforts de protection, de résilience des territoires, qu'il s'agisse de lutte contre l'artificialisation des sols, de dispositifs de verdurisation des espaces, de meilleure utilisation des lieux, des sites, d'ériger de, de, et de disposer d'infrastructures, de gérer avec l'aide notamment des nouvelles technologies, les déplacements, l'énergie ou d'autres dispositifs encore. Mais il est évident que dans la foulée de la mobilisation déjà enregistrée, ceci nécessite et nécessitera des moyens considérables, des moyens complémentaires. C'est en cela que je veux vraiment relayer la demande qui vient de vous être adressée et par ailleurs souligner que celle-ci peut aussi complémentairement se traduire par des dispositifs de flexibilité budgétaire supplémentaire et des dispositifs de prêts à long terme qui sont concédés complémentairement aux espaces, aux régions ou aux pays victimes de ces phénomènes. Thank you, uh, sir. Now I'll give the floor for I'll give the floor to, Mr. to our colleague Roberto Ciambetti from ECR for two and a half minutes. Grazie. Il sole sorgeva, ma la luce non illuminava, come la luna per tutto l'anno. Sembrava come un'eclisse di sole. Così lo storico bizantino Procopio narra quanto accadde nel 536 d.C., 
quando a seguito di una serie di eruzioni vulcaniche il clima a livello mondiale per anni consecutivi fu sconvolto da una nebbia di ceneri, un crollo drastico delle temperature, raccolte e distrutti tutto il mondo, inondazioni, fiumi che mutarono il loro corso, carestie, preludio di una crisi economica lunga oltre un secolo. Oggi chi è in prima linea davanti ai cambiamenti climatici, davanti alla transizione economica ecosostenibile, con i problemi che essa comporta per i meno ambienti, chi è in prima linea davanti alle emergenze di ogni tipo, siano esse sanitarie, economiche e sociali? Sono le istituzioni più prossime ai cittadini, le città, i territori, le regioni, cioè i primi a cui i cittadini si rivolgono, i primi enti che cercano di portare soccorso, organizzare gli aiuti, rispondere alla domanda sociale senza perdere tempo. I cataclismi e le emergenze non conoscono frontiere. La storia della nostra Europa ce lo insegna. La recente pandemia, le alluvioni dello scorso luglio fino ad arrivare a quanto sta avvenendo alla Spalmas in queste ore. Io nel 2019 sono stato relatore di un parere sulla cooperazione transfrontaliera per la prevenzione dei rischi, con una grande collaborazione da parte degli uffici della Commissione e anche delle Nazioni Unite. Oggi, proprio oggi parlare di questo, la giornata mondiale contro la prevenzione dei rischi e delle vittime dei disastri, quindi è importante parlarne oggi. Assieme ai cambiamenti che dovremo eh, assumere, dovremo costruire una vera e propria cultura della protezione civile, con la formazione e istruzione mirate per gli operatori della sicurezza pubblica, gli operatori dell'assistenza sociale e medica, i servizi di soccorso e antincendio, il cui intervento tempestivo può aiutare a contenere un disastro e ridurre le vittime durante e dopo la crisi. Dobbiamo, ricordare sul fatto, dobbiamo concordare sul fatto che la prevenzione passa necessariamente per le città, i territori e le regioni, che bisogna dunque individuare una linea strategica di intervento che assicuri al decentramento capacità di intervento tempestivo quanto autonomo. Ciò vale anche aiutare appunto i Paesi che hanno qualche difficoltà in più. In alcuni casi si possono diffondere best practices utili a tutti. Assieme alle Nazioni Unite l'Unione Europea può dunque trovare la forza per diventare attore principale nel percorso per aiutare tutti i Paesi a ridurre i rischi, a contenere gli esiti di cataclismi e disastri. Grazie per l'attenzione Presidente e buon lavoro. Thank you. Now I'll give the floor to Darius Strugala from EA. You have the floor for two minutes. Panie Przewodniczący, Panie Komisarzu, Szanowni Państwo, Męski żywiołowe stają się coraz bardziej powszechne, ekstremalne i złożone, a na ich nasilenie wpływa oczywiście zmiana klimatu. Niszczycielskie powodzie i pożary, które tego lata stały, siały spustoszenie w Europie, pokazały dobitnie, i, 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 pokazały dobitnie, że konieczne są działania na rzecz przywrócenia zmiany klimatu i transformacji ekologicznej. Jako burmistrz gminy w Polsce przekonałem się, jak ważne jest stworzenie sprawnych i efektywnych procedur działania na wypadek wystąpienia sytuacji kryzysowej. W sierpniu 2017 roku przez moją gminę przeszła nawałnica, która spustoszyła trzy czwarte obszaru gminy. Pół godziny wystarczyło, by z mapy gminy zniknęły budynki mieszkalne, budynki gospodarcze, uprawy rolne oraz parki i lasy. Panie komisarzu, zaistniała sytuacja uzmysłowiła mi również, jak bardzo nie doceniamy roli prewencji, właśnie prewencji. Nie myślimy przyszłościowo, koncentrując się na bieżących, często pozornych działaniach i oszczędnościach. Ogromnym problemem jest niewystarczający odsetek ubezpieczonego majątku. Odporność miast i regionów na zagrożenia można zwiększyć, jeżeli zarządzanie ryzykiem związanym z klęskami żywiołowymi zostanie również włączone do innych obszarów polityk. Mam tu na myśli urbanistykę, infrastrukturę, zdrowie publiczne, użytkowanie gruntów, czy dostosowanie norm budowlanych do zagrożeń i wzmocnienie oczywiście roli nadzoru budowlanego. Zarządzenie ryzykiem katastrof naturalnych, działania prewencyjne na dużą skalę, edukacja, jeszcze raz edukacja to wyzwanie, przed którymi, które przed nami stoją. To zadanie oczywiście dla państwa, administracji centralnej, również samorządowej, ale też ubezpieczycieli. Dobrze, że obecnie możliwe jest ich wsparcie środkami budżetu unijnego. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you. 
Now I give the floor to Emmanuel Di Sabato. He's online from the Greens. You have the floor for one minute. Sorry for two minutes. Merci, Monsieur le Président, chers collègues. Euh, tout d'abord, je voudrais euh, moi aussi euh, rendre hommage je, à tous les, toutes les personnes qui ont été euh, victimes de ces euh, euh, dérèglements climatiques, euh, que ce soit les personnes qui ont perdu des proches, mais aussi ceux qui ont tout perdu, tout perdu euh, y compris de manière économique et aussi les entreprises qui vivent aussi des difficultés assez sévères dans notre région. Euh, Ensuite, pointer peut-être la, la réflexion qu'un qu chroniqueur chez nous faisait à propos d'un agriculteur de 87 ans qui disait « on savait que le dérèglement climatique était un problème, mais on ne le croyait pas ». Eh bien, aujourd'hui, à travers ces différentes expressions du dérèglement climatique, on croit enfin euh, en le voyant, ce dérèglement climatique. On croyait euh, souvent que le dérèglement climatique, ce n'était pas chez nous, c'était bien loin et c'était euh, dans très longtemps. Aujourd'hui, avec ces différentes manifestations, on constate que le dérèglement climatique, c'est aussi chez nous et c'est maintenant. Alors, nous avons besoin probablement de travailler sur nos deux pieds. C'est d'abord, tout d'abord, continuer le combat pour lutter contre le changement climatique, contre le dérèglement climatique. On a évoqué toute une série de, de mécanismes, le Green Deal, le 50 for 55. Il y a toute une série de choses qui sont aujourd'hui prévues et nous en sommes satisfaits. Mais il faut probablement aller encore plus loin aujourd'hui. Nous devons aussi, par ailleurs, dégager des moyens pour nous adapter au changement de nos climats, puisque ça nous concerne aujourd'hui dans nos régions. On doit disposer de moyens pour pouvoir aborder en tout cas et nous adapter à ces changements climatiques. Alors cette crise, cette crise débouche sur des problèmes de dette supplémentaires, celles qui étaient supplémentaires après déjà le Covid qui nous a déjà fortement impacté. Le ministre président de la région dans laquelle je siège aussi l'a pointé tout à l'heure. Et donc il y a une nécessité de disposer de moyens supplémentaires pour faire face. On a évoqué la question du fonds de solidarité. Il y a différents mécanismes, en tout cas financiers, qui sont nécessaires à développer. Mais aussi la nécessité d'investir dans ces adaptations au changement climatique. Et la Wallonie a déjà décidé, notamment à travers son plan de relance, de dégager des moyens à ce sujet-là. Enfin, je me permettrai d'intervenir sur la gestion de crise. Je termine, Monsieur le Président. Euh, C'est d'avoir une capacité d'intervention européenne au niveau des pays qui vivent ces crises. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I'll give the floor to Paula Fernandez Viana for one minute. Eh, muchas gracias, Presidente. Buenas tardes, señor Comisario. Quiero empezar mi intervención con una pregunta. ¿Está la Unión Europea suficientemente equipada para hacer frente a las catástrofes naturales cuya frecuencia y magnitud aumentan con el calentamiento global? Pues me temo que por todo lo que hemos escuchado hasta ahora, la respuesta es no. ¿Es necesario reforzar? y revisar el Fondo de Solidaridad de la Unión Europea, consolidarlo, tanto en lo que respecta al volumen global del presupuesto como a los procedimientos de ejecución, que son complejos y lentos. También necesitamos que aumente la prefinanciación. Es necesario reforzar el mecanismo de protección civil de la Unión Europea, que es una de las herramientas europeas de solidaridad activa. Me gustaría defender la creación de un nuevo fondo de adaptación al cambio climático para las regiones y que se revise la estrategia global de adaptación al cambio climático de la Unión Europea. Sabemos que existen instrumentos en los programas de la política de cohesión desde 2014 y que ya habían sido utilizados por los Estados miembros para prevenir inundaciones, incendios y otras catástrofes. Pero hay que hacerlo más en la programación actual de la política de cohesión y en el plan de recuperación. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Now I'll give the floor to Dirk Vedel. You have the floor for one minute. Dirk Vedel, you have the floor for one minute. You have to push the speak button. Ah, there you are. No. We'll get back to you later. Mr. Kourakis, you have the floor for one minute. Kyrie, kyrie Prodre, kyrie Petrope, kyrie Shiki, kyrie Sinadelfi, ta fiska fenomena ekun simvali στην ανάπτυξη και εξέλιξη της ζωής. Αυτά όμως τα φυσικά φαινόμενα σήμερα διαθέτουν υψηλό δυναμικό να προκαλέσουν καταστροφές. Η εποχή μας χαρακτηρίζεται από τη μετατροπή των φυσικών φαινομένων σε φυσικούς κινδύνους 
και κατ' επέκταση σε φυσικά καταστροφικά φαινόμενα. Το νησί που κατάγομαι, η Κρήτη, το τελευταίο διάστημα, τις τελευταίες μέρες, δέχεται πλήγματα από συνεχείς σεισμούς. Προχθές είχαμε 6, ρίχτερ με τεράστιες καταστροφές σε σπίτια, σε κατοικίε, σε σχολεία, σε ναούς, σε επαγγελματικέ στέγες και χθε είχαμε ένα υψηλό σεισμό 6,3 με πάρα πολλές καταστροφές. Οι σεισμοί λοιπόν, τα ακραία καιρικά φαινόμενα, τα έντονα πλημμυρικά φαινόμενα, οι μεταβολές στο παράκτιο περιβάλλον, οι μορφολογικές μεταβολές, οι πυρκαγιές και γενικότερα η σε εξέλιξη κλιματική αλλαγή, κρίση, συνιστούν ένα κυρίαρχο πρόβλημα σε τοπικό, περιφερειακό, εθνικό, ευρωπαϊκό και παγκόσμιο επίπεδο. Τι απαιτείται. Απαιτείται λοιπόν αύξηση του προϋπολογισμού καταρχήν του Ταμείου Αλληλεγγύης, του Ευρωπαϊκού Ταμείου Αλληλεγγύης και δεύτερο, απαιτείται εξειδίκευση σε όλα αυτά τα επίπεδα μέτρων, μελετών, έργων και δράσεων που θα πρέπει να λαμβάνουν υπόψη τους αυτά τα δεδομένα προκειμένου να υπάρχει αποτελεσματικότητα την περίοδο της, της κρίσης. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ. Σας ευχαριστώ εγώ κύριε Κουράκη. Uh, I would like to give the floor now to our first vice president, Mr. Cordeiro. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lenersik, uh, Special Representative Mizutori. Um, there, are, there are few fields of governance and of life of our communities where the importance of local and regional authorities is so evident, so clear, and so decisive than when we're facing natural disasters. When it's happening, local and regional authorities are the first ones to arrive and the last ones to leave. They're the first ones to whom people look for help, for assistance, and for aid. And we have a clear example of that in a natural disaster that it's happening right now. The volcanic erup eruption in Canary Islands. So I think I can express the feeling of everyone in this chamber when I say that our thoughts and prayers are with the people of Canary Islands and with the authorities of Canary Islands. So I join my voice to the voice of the ones that require a stronger consideration of the role of local and regional authorities in this matter. But, dear Commissioner, natural disasters in some cases are only the effects are only the consequences. That's why we think that the role of local and regional authorities must be considered in a more proeminent way when we are talking about their intervention, our intervention, in policies that can directly mean more control on the effects of natural disasters. Land management, risks, buildings rules, and so coastal areas, and so other areas. It's not worth to cry over spilled milk when we're facing natural disasters, when in policies where the role of local and regional authorities can and makes the difference is not duly considered. So I conclude my intervention with this appeal. In this day of the reduction of the effects of international, of, of natural disasters, let us not only consider the importance of local and regional authorities when these kind of events are happening, let us consider the role and the importance of local and regional authorities when we can do something 
to avoid the most dramatic effects of natural disasters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Vedel, please, from Renew Europe. Ja, sehr geehrter Herr Präsident, Herr Kommissar Lennertschis, Frau Misotori, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, es ist mittlerweile mehr als zwei Monate her, dass Nordrhein-Westfalen, Rheinland-Pfalz, östliche Teile Belgiens und andere Regionen Europas von einer verheerenden Umweltkatastrophe heimgesucht wurden. Noch nie dagewesene Hochwasserstände haben Mitte Juli dieses Jahres für viel menschliches Leid und erheblichen wirtschaftlichen Schaden gesorgt. Im Namen der Menschen in NRW möchte ich mich auf diesem Weg für Ihre Anteilnahme und Ihre Unterstützung herzlich bedanken. Wichtig war der Landesregierung und dem Parlament die schnelle Bereitstellung von Wiederaufbaumitteln. Das ist uns auch gelungen. Entsprechende Beschlüsse auf Bundesebene des Aufbauhilfegesetz 2021 stellen den Betroffenen insgesamt 30 Milliarden Euro zur Verfügung. Und 12 Milliarden Euro davon entfallen auf Geschädigte in Nordrhein-Westfalen. react eu gelder fließen ebenfalls in diese Gebiete. Es zeigt sich, die grenzüberschreitende Zusammenarbeit im Bereich Hochwasser- und Katastrophenschutz ist entscheidend. Aber die Kooperationen müssen weiter ausgebaut werden, beispielsweise bei der Risikoanalyse im Vorfeld von Extremwetterereignissen und bei der Schadensermittlung in den Grenzregionen. Für Nordrhein-Westfalen gilt, wir brauchen mehr gelebte europäische Zusammenarbeit, nicht weniger. Vielen Dank. Danke schön. Miss Rossmann, please. Vielen Dank, Herr Präsident. Kolleginnen und Kollegen, danke für dieses wichtige Thema und alles, was schon angesprochen wurde. Ich will auch noch einmal den Fokus richten auf diese grenzüberschreitende Zusammenarbeit, auch in der Vorsorge, wie in der Euregio Tirol, Südtirol, Trentino, haben hier viele gemeinsame Projekte wie Wetterradar, gemeinsamer Lawinenrapport, gemeinsame Katastrophenübungen. Aber wir müssen auch auf jene schauen, die im Ernstfall im Einsatz sind, dass sie keine Probleme haben. Wir haben als Tiroler Landtag 2019 die Konferenz Science mit Parlament äh, ins Leben gerufen oder dazu eingeladen, unterstützt von der Europäischen Kommission, um den Ist-Zustand zu bewerten und schauen, welche Themen wir für die Zukunft brauchen. Denn grenzüberschreitende Einsätze haben ja oft sehr viel mit Versicherung und Haftungsfragen zu tun. Äh, und hier müssen wir auch die notwendigen Rahmenbedingungen schaffen. Wir werden in den nächsten Monaten einen Textvorschlag auch für Rechtsänderungen bekommen zwischen den Staaten, denn ich glaube, es ist wichtig, dass jene, die im Einsatzfall vor Ort sind, sich auch auf die Hilfe vor Ort, auf die Menschen konzentrieren können und sich nicht mit rechtlichen äh, Themen auseinandersetzen müssen. Und das ist bei diesem Bereich auch für uns ein sehr wichtiges Zukunftsthema. Vielen Dank. Danke schön. Mr. Aguilar Vasquez, please. Muchas gracias. En buena parte de los servicios operativos involucrados en desastres naturales, emergencias, sanidad, asistencias sociales, son proporcionados por las administraciones regionales. Por ello, sería muy útil que se traslade a las regiones, desde los niveles nacionales y europeo, recursos económicos proporcionales a sus características, teniendo en cuenta la extensión territorial la dispersión de la población y las características naturales. La Unión Europea debe proporcionar un marco normativo y financiero adecuado para favorecer flexibilidad y rapidez en contextos de crisis excepcionales o inesperados. Emergencias globales como las de la crisis COVID nos demuestran que hace falta que exista un marco adecuado y claro que favorezca un contexto de flexibilidad y agilidad y aumente la operatividad y la rapidez de la respuesta facilitando la aplicación de recursos económicos y fondos europeos en esta respuesta. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Mr. Frey, please. Sehr geehrter Herr Kommissar, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, herzlichen Dank für die Vorlage des sehr informativen Vermerks. Besonders wichtig erachte ich auch, wie meine, einige meiner Vorredner, die Seite 4, wo äh, die, das Potenzial bei der Zusammenarbeit in den Grenzregionen erwähnt ist, wo ja über 40 Prozent unserer Bevölkerung leben. Oft wird in diesen Regionen nur ein 180-Grad-Winkel äh, benutzt, um die Situation zu betrachten, anstatt auch die Kooperation mit der Nachbarin und mit dem Nachbarn auf der anderen 
anderen Seite der Grenze zu suchen. Hier liegen noch mehr Synergien. Und deshalb halte ich es für unerlässlich, dass erstens die Kommunikationswege für Vorwarnungen von der europäischen bis zur lokalen Ebene obligatorisch eingerichtet und regelmäßig überprüft werden. Zweitens Katastrophenschutz- und Evakuierungskonzepte grenzüberschreitend geplant werden. Drittens diese Konzepte in Übungen alle fünf Jahre grenzüberschreitend überprüft werden. Viertens ein einheitliches Kommunikationsnetz für Rettungs- und Sicherheitsdienste in den Grenzregionen eingerichtet wird. Und fünftens die Hospitalkapazitäten grenzüberschreitend in Echtzeit bekannt sind. Dazu braucht es Anstrengungen auf allen Governance-Ebenen. Ich meine, die lokale und regionale Ebene sollte dazu, zu, dazu bereit sein, zu ihrer eigenen Sicherheit. Thank you very much. Mr. Kobor, please. Dear colleagues, climate change means, among others, the distribution of precipitation radically changed after heat waves, weak storms, and flashing suits in a in matter of seconds. In our city, Page, no river or city is relatively dry city. Therefore, these events were shocking. Flashing fruits from the mountains made serious damage, as it was in Belgium, for instance. However, in addition to acute protection measures and disaster management, a new approach is needed in the, in the long term. We need to learn new city planning, less extra stone streets, more local water reservoir, find and open old creek beds, which were known by our predecessor in the city in the past. Without it, all of these disaster events will happen again and more often. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ali, please. Thank you, Mr. President, dear Commissioner, dear Ms. Mizutari. The COVID-19 pandemic tested and assessed our crisis management and emergency response capacities at EU level and deepened our reflection towards a long-term vision and future-proof solutions in this field. Natural disasters, crises and emergencies such as the forest fires we had this summer require swift and targeted action aiming first at saving lives and the integrity of the concerned population. In order to provide an efficient and effective response, we should focus on three main axes of action. First, we should focus on building our capacities, preventive measures and preparedness plans at regional and local levels. On prevention, we need the Commission's guidance on good governance, effective management and funding opportunities not only at national but also at regional and local levels. The preparedness plans must allow for effective and swift response to emergencies which should be assessed by national authorities and communicated to related EU services when the actual need occurs. <laughs> Second, the cross-border regions are particularly sensitive to emergencies as they are often isolated. Therefore, the elaboration of cross-border projects of common interest, including in the field of crisis management, and the access of local and regional authorities to the related funding is of particular importance. Third, a crisis management and the emergency response are effective only if the necessary support is ensured in a timely manner. We need an EU response team ready to be deployed in times of critical emergencies. Finally, the integrity and the prosperity of our regions and local population is at the forefront of our political agendas. We need tailor-made solutions and concrete emergency response and resilience strategies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Mr. Torres Perez, please. Muchas gracias. Quiero agradecer al Comité Europeo que me dejen intervenir en este Día Internacional de la Prevención de Desastres Naturales cuando la isla de La Palma, en Canarias, está sufriendo un desastre natural. Llevamos con el día de hoy 25 días con un volcán en erupción que es tremendamente agresivo, el más grave que jamás ha tenido Canarias y que no sabemos cuándo va a acabar si será cuestión de semanas o meses. En el día de ayer fueron 20.000 toneladas de dióxido de azufre el que se emitió por parte de este volcán, que unido al daño material, más de 1.000 edificaciones desaparecidas, más de 700 hectáreas consumidas, puede hacer que estemos ante el volcán de mayor gravedad de Europa en los últimos 100 años. Por ello, desde una región ultraperiférica como es Canarias, pido sensibilidad, y apoyo con los fondos de solidaridad, agilización administrativa. La isla de La Palma y Canarias está ante el desastre más grave de toda su historia y pedimos al comité una respuesta acorde a lo que es el daño producido por este fenómeno que es un volcán por este desastre natural. Gracias. 
Thank you, Mr. Arma Mr. Armao, please. Grazie Presidente, grazie al Commissario Danarcic del sua relazione e soprattutto del fatto di aver richiamato, come diceva il Presidente Cirio, la vicenda dell'Italia, dei grandi e drammatici eventi dell'Italia, in particolare eh, quelli subiti dalla Sicilia. E colgo l'occasione per esprimere la solidarietà di tutti noi alle isole Canarie per il dramma che stanno vivendo. Proprio sul punto è necessario eh, però avere un approccio ampio, non solo che guardi al tema dei disastri naturali, ma che guardi anche alle modalità di intervento e di prevenzione. Il 70% del territorio della Sicilia è eh, destinato a desertificarsi. Queste sono le previsioni dei, per i prossimi anni, ma così avviene anche in altre parti del sud Europa. E allora bisogna intervenire attraverso meccanismi che rafforzino i bacini idrici, che eh, puntino alla forestazione, che rafforzino l'agricoltura, perché altrimenti ci occupiamo soltanto della fase finale del problema. Abbiamo vissuto nella piccola isola di Pantelleria, che è un'isola quasi vicina alla Tunisia, il dramma delle, delle eh, trombe d'aria che hanno devastato il territorio e ucciso Persone. Ecco, è necessario un intervento eh, multisettoriale, un approccio diversificato proprio per raggiungere gli obiettivi. In ultimo, eh, proprio perché si richiamava l'esperienza delle Canarie, eh, è necessario che nei confronti delle isole vi sia un approccio specifico della protezione civile, perché fare protezione civile nelle isole è molto più complicato e impone molte più risorse. Grazie Presidente. Thank you very much and uh, our last intervention for today for this uh, very interesting debate is uh, Mr. Sousa Silva. Muito obrigado, Sr. Presidente, cumprimentar o Sr. Comissário, cumprimentar também a Sra. Representante Especial do Secretário-Geral das Nações Unidas para a Redução do Risco de Catástrofes e cumprimentar os caros colegas. Uh, dizer que as autoridades locais e regionais são as primeiras a ser chamadas em situações de emergência pela proximidade e também pela confiança que as populações depositam na sua atuação. Por isso, as respostas às catástrofes estão sempre associadas a uma resposta de baixo para cima, bottom up. Não restam dúvidas de que este assunto tem uma grande componente local e também regional, para além da componente nacional, que, na minha e na nossa opinião, é uma componente de coordenação. A questão que endereça ao Sr. Comissário é a seguinte. De que forma é que a Comissão Europeia acautelou o financiamento de ações de prevenção e também de resposta, quer no âmbito dos vários planos de recuperação e resiliência, quer do próximo quadro comunitário 2030. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, Commissioner. After having heard uh, uh, our members and uh, their concerns and ideas, I now give you the floor for your reaction. Thank you, President. I think you will agree that the number of interventions and uh, their substance proves the interest of the representatives of local and regional authorities in the matter on the agenda that we are discussing now. And uh, for me, it has been extremely useful and interesting to, to, to listen to your voices, as always, as always, as in Athens not so long ago, and first time I appeared before this committee a while ago. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Chirio for um, uh, his role as a rapporteur on the Union Civil Protection Mechanism revision. This revision process has been successfully completed. We now have the mechanism which is more flexible, more effective, more robust. But you also mentioned the Solidarity Fund, as did some other uh, speakers. Uh, I will uh, only say a few things about that because Solidarity Fund is um, under the responsibility of my colleague, Commissioner for, for uh, regional affairs, regional affairs which is cohesion and other structural funds. And uh, there are some uh, issues that we both, Commissioner Ferreira and myself, share. First of all, the fact is the Solidarity Fund is small. It's a small bag of money. Second, the, the threshold to qualify for funding for, from, for, from Solidarity Fund is very high. As was uh, mentioned by some, uh, it's difficult to reach that threshold 
beyond which one would qualify for, for the assistance, financial assistance from Solidarity Fund. I do think that um, there is a good case to first increase the funding available through Solidarity Fund and second to lower the threshold so that more regions, more local uh, communities that are affected by uh, natural and other disaster would qualify for this expression of European solidarity, which is Solidarity Fund. Uh, but one also has to take into account the, the fact that so far the Solidarity Fund has not been conceived as uh, being uh, there to compensate entirely for the damage that has been incurred by localities, by the regions, by member states facing uh, the natural and other disaster. Having said that, I repeat, there is a very strong case to increase the funding available, and this is certainly a discussion in which, when it takes place, I will support such an increase, also in view of the increased uh, frequency and in intensity of weather-related events that, we, that were plain to see uh, this summer alone. Uh, Mr. Patulis, uh, I agree that <coughs> we need to involve uh, local authorities more. I'm trying to do that. Uh, I appear whenever invited before this committee and always with great pleasure. And I thank President Tsitsikosas for each invitation and also for his invitation to uh, meet with the governors of Greek regions, in particular those that were affected by wildfires last summer. It's always very useful for me to hear directly from local and regional authorities about uh, disaster risks, about disaster risk management, and about the, the, the uh, disaster management. I would nevertheless also invite you all to make sure that national authorities, authorities at the national level of member states, are aware of your views, because they are the ones that are officially our interlocutors in this and other matters. One should not forget that civil protection, and that includes disaster risk reduction, disaster risk management, is a competence of member states. The Commission plays a supportive role, but we would like to play this role very actively, of course. Uh, on floods in Wallonia, this was the first time ever for Belgium to ask for assistance from the Union Civil Protection Mechanism, which gives, you, which gives you an impression of how big a challenge this was. First time ever. The Union Civil Protection Mechanism has been there for 20 years now. Actually, this year we mark 20th anniversary of the inception of the Union Civil Protection Mechanism. And this was the first time that Belgium activated this mechanism when faced with these with this unprecedented floods. I was glad to see that the member states responded quickly, immediately, so, so that we were able to, to channel through the Union Civil Protection Mechanism the assistance of more than 150 rescue workers from France, from Italy, and from Austria to help local, local and regional uh, services face, face the, the challenge that was brought about with these uh, terrible floods. Uh, Mr. Boussus also uh, reminded us of the importance to work on mitigation. Mitigation. Because we probably will never be able to get prepared and to have the capacity, response capacity for ever, ever increasing intensity and frequency of weather related disasters. Which means we have to focus more on prevention. We have to focus more on mitigation. And these are actually the issues that the Commission has tried to address with its proposals concerning Green Deal and uh, Fit for 55. You will uh, also recall that the Commission, in its um, uh, recovery and resilience uh, instrument, which was prompted by the pandemic, and the impact on the economy that the pandemic has brought, the Commission proposed this recovery and resilience plans in a way to address also the mitigation that 
we need to undertake in view of the climate change. That's why it requires at least 37% of recovery and resilient funds to be channeled to green transition. It is the green transition that is the key mitigation measure. It is a key prevention measure to reduce the disaster risk related to weather uh, uh, events in the future. Uh, and this is also uh, related to what Mr. Ciambetti said about the economic impact of the climate change. We hear now a lot of discussions about how much it will cost when we undertake green transition. How much it will cost if we uh, abandon fossil fuels. Our answer is it will cost many times more if we don't do this. It will cost many times more because the weather-related events will be ever more intense and the damage from these events will be exorbitant if nothing is done now. Uh, <clears throat> and this also would be my, my uh, answer to Mr. Strugawa. Uh, the importance of prevention is obvious in a simple information that I can share with you that every euro spent on prevention can save up to seven euro in response. So it's much cheaper to work in preventive measure. But there are, of course, things that we can no longer prevent, and for those we, can, we must be prepared. We, for instance, cannot prevent uh, volcano eruptions or earthquakes but we can improve our preparedness for those through the building code, uh, through uh, pre uh, other preparedness measures, and uh, uh, thus reduce, reduce the disaster risk emanating from geological uh, events. Uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Di Sabato that uh, today it's clear, or at least should be clear to everyone, that the climate crisis is already here and that we need to accelerate our work on adaptation and mitigation. And here we are looking very much at the uh, Conference of the State Parties uh, in Glasgow in a couple of weeks from now, where the European Union would like to play a leading role in accelerating the international efforts towards climate adaptation and mitigation, including towards uh, the efforts towards the zero emission world. Uh, Mrs. Fernandez Vianya uh, mentioned the resources. Yes, we can use a lot of resources for uh, disaster risk reduction. Not only the resources from Solidarity Fund, which can help recovery, because I already said that this fund is relatively small, but also cohesion funds can be used in a smart manner so as to reduce the risk of disasters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kurakis, for mentioning Crete and uh, the uh, ongoing uh, earthquakes uh, there. I discussed this with the um, Greek Minister of uh, Climate Crisis and uh, Civil Protection, Mr. Stylianidis, just uh, two days ago. Uh, the fact is that Greece is one of the areas that are most prone to various disasters, floods, wildfires, and also earthquakes. And that's why uh, I agreed with Minister Stylianidis that we should work more closely together on various prevention and preparedness measures. Uh, on La Palma eruption, I would like to note, uh, and this is goes to both uh, interventions by Mr. Alves Cordeiro as well as Mr. Torres Perez. The drama continues, as we discuss here, the drama on La Palma in the Canary Islands continues. There seems to be no end in sight. Uh, I would like here to express my sympathy and solidarity with the people of La Palma, especially those who lost their homes. But at the same time, I wish to note that the, there is more than 1,000 emergency personnel already engaged the Spanish uh, services uh, uh, are able to cope with the situation, and for the time being, uh, they did not uh, uh, seek the uh, assistance from the Union Civil Protection Mechanism. This assistance, of course, remains available if there is a need for that. But at the moment, I can 
see that uh, the Spanish uh, re responders are able to cope with the situation. I do hope myself that this situation will be over soon for the sake of um, people of, of La Palma and the Canaries. Uh, there has to be more EU cooperation. I agree with Mr. Vidal, especially in um, prevention and preparedness. And that's why in the revision of the Union Civil Protection Mechanism that we have uh, successfully negotiated and is now adopted, we have decided to formulate disaster resilience goals at the European level. And this would also cover cross-border disaster risks that many of you mentioned. It's interesting to know that so far there has been no disaster resilience goals at the European level. Now we'll have them. We are working very closely with the member states on formulating these resilience goals, also on the basis of various scenarios that can uh, play out. And here I would again uh, call on all regional and local authorities to give their feedback to national authorities in this, in this exercise. I think that I have largely tried to answer uh, all the issues raised, perhaps uh, a reaction also to what um, Mr. Ali said. Yes, this summer tested us all. It has tested local and regional authorities with all the floods and fire, wildfires. It has tested national authorities and it has tested the European Union civil protection mechanism. And I'm glad to note that every single request for assistance that we received was answered, every single one. Floods in Belgium, forest fires in Cyprus, in Greece, in Italy, and so on. Every single request for assistance was met with response. Member states helped each other, and this was, while well, it was a difficult test for us all, it was also a good summer for European solidarity, which proved itself. And we do have, we do have a wonderful uh, mechanism, me wonderful heart of our Union Civil Protection Mechanism, which is called Emergency Response Coordination Center. This center works 24 hours, seven days a week, and transfers every, any request for assistance in a real time to all EU member states, and then starts working on organizing and supporting the collective response. Uh, and this summer uh, proved that it works, it works uh, well. Mr. Almao, you mentioned the danger of uh, uh, desertification of Sicily. Uh, it's one of the impacts that we can expect from climate change. Uh, and that's, again, uh, that just tells us that we need to act. There is no time to lose. We need to act. We need to work on adaptation, on mitigation. These, there, there are a variety of measures that can reduce the danger that we can already see coming. Refor you mentioned reforestation. Uh, we can also talk, uh, discuss uh, various land management uh, issues, forest manage management issues. There is a lot uh, we can do. And I will now conclude on this point. What exactly can be done? We can only answer to this question if we have input from you also. So I would conclude with uh, my uh, invitation again to all regional and local authorities to make your input when it comes to disaster risk reduction, disaster risk management, not only to your national authorities, which are which bear the primary responsibility for civil protection, but also to our European system through the knowledge network that we are now setting, setting up. I would like to conclude, Mr. President, with um, appreciation for this extremely informative and rich exchange. I do remain available to you and members of the Committee of the Regions for further exchanges, uh, and I'm thanking you again for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Commissioner, I want to thank you uh, myself uh, for 
being here for us. It's uh, very important that in these turbulent and difficult times, we have someone like you standing by the regions and the cities of Europe in difficult times, especially in times of crisis. And just as I witnessed your work during this past summer in Greece, I am sure that a lot of our colleagues has, have witnessed as well how uh, dedicated uh, you are and productive in, in what you do here in the Commission vis-a-vis -vis the crisis management. And I want you to know that uh, you can also view us, regions and cities of Europe and the European Committee of Regions, as your strongest ally in the effort you are doing to create this mechanism. Uh, I congratulate you again and uh, I thank you very much for being here today. I would like to give the floor now to Ms. Mizutori for her final remarks before I uh, say goodbye to the Commissioner. Thank you very much, President. Thank you once again for inviting me to this very, very important debate. I have heard the clear urgency in the voices and the language of the esteemed delegates. Commissioner has given a very, very comprehensive uh, response, but I would like to offer some uh, reflections. First, rapid and effective response after a disaster strikes is crucial, and we have seen that done in Europe this summer. However, as many delegates mentioned, with the intensity and frequency of disasters of all kinds getting higher and higher, we need to prevent better we need to have more disaster risk reduction. We cannot wait until disasters come and strike us. And that is why last year, just before COVID started, the commissioner and myself, we signed a letter together asking member states, requesting member states to have their national strategies for disaster risk reduction. Now, these strategies have to, and I'm echoing the voices of the delegates, have to understand that disasters do not respect borders. So regional cooperation is very important. We need to also know that disasters affect all of us, but not in the same way. The most vulnerable people have to be protected and have to be made agents of change. And cities, the cities are the ones that the building of resilience is urgent. It must be done now. So let us work together to implement the joint plan of action of the Making City Resilient 2030 to save lives, livelihoods, economies, and to support the cities which are at the front line. Prevention saves lives. We know that, but we need to do that. My final words, natural disaster. These are words that we all use in UN system, and here we are debating about natural disasters, but I think we have to stop thinking, are they really natural? Because many times disasters are a result of our no action or action that creates disaster, like con constructing houses in a floodplain, knowing that it is a dangerous area. So perhaps we need to start thinking that disasters are not natural and we have the power to make sure that disasters do not impact us as they do, as they did this summer in Europe. Finally, I welcome everybody to the European Forum for Disaster Risk Reduction next month, 24-26 in Matosinhos, Portugal, because I am sure that this very important dialogue debate will continue in Portugal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Mizutori, for your dedication. And uh, we are re really looking forward uh, to working with you, the Committee of Regions, with you and with uh, Commissioner Lenarchitz to see how we will uh, go forward with the regional resilience platform that uh, I think we, we, we all agree on. So thank you again, Ms. Uh, Mizutori. Thank you uh, for your physical presence, uh, Commissioner. And uh, we are really looking forward in working with you and collaborating uh, in order to give the best possible response and tackling all the major crises that could have ahead of us. Thank you very much, Commissioner.